Hi there, my name is Aaron Short. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Today is Monday, April 15th. I'm back to the old setup again. I think I'm going to keep the teleprompter for videos so that I can use um, some scripts and some key, key points to talk about in the video. But I did have the problem last week with the frame rate, as someone did say, and I need to do some more testing with that. Um, it's a shame because that's a good idea in concept, but we'll see. Anyway, back to the old setup. I, I like having the whole screen. I mean, I bought the whole screen. I might as well use it, right? So uh, welcome. Let me know if you can hear me okay. But Bidoin was first. Uh, good job. Says, hi, Aaron and all you pickers. I've been picking. I'm, I'm working on... I'm working on um, hybrid picking. Does anyone do hybrid picking? I've always been a kind of afraid of it. And I can't, then I realized that I actually do it anyway. I, I do it when I take solos. But I've been working on hybrid Travis picking, which I thought would be really difficult. It actually is much, I don't want to say easier, because it's not easy, but it's easier than I thought it would be. You still got to do loads of time on it to get it like really robotic, but it's funny because uh, the, the way your hand sits, I've got um, a blister on this part of my hand. You see that red mark there? Where the string rubs. So I need that to, I need that to become a callus. Well, you know, often we're used to getting the calluses on the left hand, and now I'm getting the callus right there. It's like a weird, weird spot, but that's where it rests on the low E string. So I think if you haven't looked into that, you should try, try it out. It's really fun. It really opens up a lot of avenues for different things. Uh, Kevin was next. Good to see you, Kevin, in Southern Indiana. Southern Indiana. Paul says, hello, Aaron, everyone watching from Southern Ohio. Hello from Colorado. This is great. We could do a, a tour of America here. Um, Patsy Smith in Suffolk, UK. Mad for it, Manchester in the UK is Graham. Graham, have you still got the guitar? How's that working out for you? Let us know. I'd like an update. And Rosanna's here with the spanner, the wrench, the wrench, the wrench spanner, the blue thing. <laughs> Um, thanks for moderating. She says, good evening. This is great. Let me know if you've got any questions. And um, I will give you an update on my week. So my guitar is still at Sweetwater. I've not been called yet with the evaluation. I've no I noticed something the other day. I'm getting really into this this thing now. This, this um, project that I'm working on right now is this whole thing about acoustic guitar intonation. Now, first of all, I think it's really important to say intonation there's two ways to think about intonation on the acoustic some people say the intonation of an acoustic guitar drives them crazy yeah that's the intonation of the whole guitar that's like i said last week with the piano that's it's not perfect it's an imperfect system your guitar will never be perfectly intonated unless you do a lot of wacky things to it in the same way a piano will never be perfectly intonated unless you buy a digital keyboard that has um perfect intonation built into it uh, as a setting so i covered that last week but i think maybe some people didn't understand not just here but in general people don't, people don't understand what i'm talking about when i talk about the intonation i'm simply talking about the fact that the 12th fret note fretted is is not perfectly in tune with the open string that's what i'm talking about but something interesting happening happened this week i restrung the martin guitar with my dreadnought, which had perfect intonation. I think that was the Martin strings on there. I put the Daddario XS strings on there and the D was flat again. So if you watch the show last year, I said, I thought I, thought I had some defective Daddario strings. I think the strings have different tensions and therefore when you put a new brand of strings on your guitar, if you want everything to be 100%, and you care about that stuff like I do, then you need to reset up the whole guitar again. So usually we just change, you put another gauge on, put another brand on and just play, right? But if you're really particular about the feel of the guitar and the intonation of the 12th fret, it seems to me that you need to then completely reset up the guitar. But we'll find out because if Sweetwater do pleck and reset up that guitar with those strings, it should come back to me perfectly intonated. Now, this isn't the fault. It's not the strings fault because it also wasn't intonated with the original Elixir strings. And also, when I put Elixir strings on that guitar as a test, it was still out. So it just seems to me, which would make sense, that what the factories, the company should do is put their strings on. So Martin put Martin strings on and then intonate the guitar with those strings on that guitar. That's what should happen. 
And even then, I've got my custom shop OM. That's not perfectly intonated. So this, this is such a, a rocky road, all this stuff. It's such a, a massive topic. And that's why I want to make a video on it. That's why I'm paying to have Sweetwater do the work on my guitar. I want to do a video about this. I really feel strongly about it, as you can tell. But uh, let, let me know if you've got any thoughts on that. But like I said, there's, I need to put that in my video. There's two things to think about here. There's, is the guitar intonated like when you play an E major? Is that in tune? And then the, D's, the D major chord is out of tune? Yeah, that's because the guitar is an imperfect instrument and it will never be perfect. But the other thing to talk about is, is your guitar in tune with itself at the 12th fret? And that's my issue at the moment. So I hope that clears it up if anyone <laughs> was even thinking about it. But I do like to be clear on here in case people get the wrong impression. Like I'm not trying to make guitars perfectly in tune when I play any chord on them. I'm not trying to do that. It's not possible. I'm trying to get the guitar so it's in tune with itself. And that is possible. I've got one, one of the um, uh, Cole Clarks has perfect intonation it is possible and there's no reason why it shouldn't be as long as it's set up correctly so stay tuned i should have more information hopefully they'll get in touch with me this week or next week at the latest and i'll have more information on um what i'm going to do to proceed with that i'm th i think it'll be fun i'm thinking i'm going to do a i'm going to pay for a plec and a full setup and tell them i want the intonation 100 percent. and when i get that guitar back i'm going to make an in-depth video about is it possible and did Sweetwater manage to do it and then kind of go on from there you know so alan's in portugal yes yeah, hot here alan it's 70 degrees prodigal says learning hybrid picking too car minor has some great hybrid picking tunes very cool yeah, I, I've really, I'm really going for it. I haven't practiced this much in a long time. It actually feels great. I'm actually really enjoying the shift here of, of playing. Perhaps I should do a video on hybrid picking. Um, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. It's where it's, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's where you hold the pick. So usually what I tend to do is strum or put the pick down. I usually put the pick back in my pocket or on the table and then just use fingers and finger pick right john mayer does this cool thing on one on some of his songs where he holds the pick in his finger like this his fourth finger and then he can use these three fingers to pick so he, yeah, yeah when you see him on stage when he does one of his songs where he'll finger pick and then go into strumming you'll actually see him doing this he's finger picking like this with these three fingers i tend to use three fingers anyway the problem with the hybrid picking is that it then as you're holding the pick so hybrid picking is you're holding the pick and picking with these fingers so as i don't use the four the, the, the pinky and this finger um when i don't hold the pick they are now weak and i need to strengthen them up so that's the only thing about that but they should be strong anyway it's something that i should work on anyway actually i know i rest the pinky i tend to rest the pinky on the guitar so this finger here is usually weak weaker when i'm hybrid picking i need that to be stronger when I'm finger picking, I use these three only. And yeah, um, it's, it's really interesting. And uh, um, John Mayer does this and then picks with these three. You've got to watch that, that pick doesn't come out of your hand, of course. So it's also a good idea to have the picks on the mic stand while you're doing it. In case you drop it, you can grab one off the mic stand. But um, that's really cool too. And then he's got it, he's got it down. He'll just do that. And he's got his pick. He'll do that what I just did, but faster. So he'll he'll go from fingers to pick. So that's how he does it. He literally, I think he does it. He literally just put your thumb on the pick, push up, and you've got it between the two, the thumb and the finger. But he does it so fast, he can go from the finger picking to the strumming instantly. So that's I guess that's a good thing you could practice on the subway. You know, just like doing that and, and then putting it back again <laughs> putting the back is hard <laughs> yeah and then yeah so this hybrid picking is cool because you don't have to do that you don't have to put the pick down and then pick it up again pardon the pun this would be a great video will not it? all these puns i can have the the um the cool thing is you can be strumming with the pick and then you just li simply add in the fingers while you're picking but it certainly is something to get used to.
because I finger finger style without the pick is so much easier because it's just the fingers moving. They're all very flexible now, you know, because I've, I've practiced with them so much. But then to have something in the hand while you're doing that, that's kind of hard. Because there's, there's some restriction and tension caused by gripping the pick. So it's really, I, I should have done it years ago. It's really cool. I might grab the guitar and show you a couple of things that I'm talking about because I'm getting some questions. Like Alan says, do we really need 100% perfect guitars when they are played from imperfect humans? Yes, we do. Because that just makes life even harder. So I tell you what, I'm going to grab the guitar and I'm going to, I'll, I'll give you one second. I'm going to plug the guitar in here and uh, I'm going to show you a couple of things that I'm talking about because I've got it set up from, from practicing. So one sec. to me I need to get away from you and as I watched her lying next to me I wished for a holiday too home is where the heart is home is where the heart is home is where All right, let me go to a close-up here. Hide my belly. That's what guitars are for, right? One, two, one, two. Okay, let me see if this is working. Yeah, so the thing is, right, I just want to make it clear. And then I'll, I'll never mention this again after this until I make the video. <laughs> so look, here's your open, and you can try try this on your guitar for me at home, because um, I'm, I'm interested to know. So if you play the open D string, and I'm using strobe tuners, I love strobe tuner, tuners. I've re, you know re reviewed all these Peterson tuners. I love the, the strobe thing. You can get the strobe tuner for your iPhone. I I don't know about Android because I don't have Android, but um, get a strobe tuner because they're so accurate. Okay, so if I if I play the D here, so according to the strobe tuner, that's perfectly in tune. So that's just the open string. Okay, and if you if you play a harmonic by resting your finger at the twelfth fret, you get the octave. But that's the same tune. That's the same thing. That's the, they're, 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 those two are the same thing. So that's perfectly in tune, and that's perfectly in tune. Okay. Now the thing is, when you fret it, when you press it down here at the 12th fret, okay, mine is reading flat, like the other guitar, like the maintainers. Now, one thing is, if you press really hard, it will go sharp. So I can probably press so hard that it goes into tune. There we go, that's now in tune, because I'm pressing really hard. So that's one thing you gotta bear in mind when you set this intonation here. When you, how hard do you play? I would say ideally you play with just the right pressure that you don't get buzz. You don't want buzz, but you don't want to be gripping the guitar like a vice either. And that will make it go sharp. So at normal pressure, that's slightly flat. And the other strings on this guitar are fine at normal pressure. You can also use your ear if you play the string open and then play the fretted note. Slightly flat. Like you could play a D on the low E string and the octave. It's slightly out. So when you, I think you were probably just kidding, right? About um, you're just kidding before about the. Uh, does it matter? Well, it, 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 look, this is the simplest thing to do in the world: is to play this three note three note D chord up here with the open D at the end of a song. That's actually not too bad, but. If the intonation is as bad as it is on the maintain that I sent in to be repaired, or, you know, be set up, then that just sounds horrible. Because what you've got is that D ringing out against these three high notes. So I've got 
um, 10, 10, and 11. So 10 on the high E, 10 on the B, 11 on the G, with the open D. If I just played those, those three notes up high, it'd be fine. But once you add in that low D, because it's an open string, it's, it's not perfect. But this is way better than the other guitar was that's gone to Sweetwater. But you want those thing, kind of things to ring out, you know, if you do something like this. So this is pretty good, this guitar. All the strings are good apart from the Ds, a little bit flat. So that's the only thing with this one. And then um, someone mentioned about James Taylor. So this is exactly what I'm talking about, Paul. I'm just trying to make this clear. So James Taylor will use a sweetened tuning, which is in the Peterson tuners as well. By the way, if you buy one, it's, in, it's built into this. It's, it's called the sweetened guitar tuning. So for example, the B string is tuned um, slightly different to the other strings than, than a regular tuner. But this is what I'm talking about. James Taylor retunes all his strings slightly differently to standard tuning so that most of the chords sound in tune. Because the thing is, if you play a, if you play a D and you feel like it's perfectly in tune, and then you play an A, and then an E, and then a G. I actually think this guitar is pretty good, but there's always going to be one chord that isn't ringing out as well as others. So you have to bear that in mind. But that's not what I'm talking about. That's why you get those fancy nuts. That's, <laughs> that's why you get those squiggly frets. That's for that issue. My issue is I simply want these to all be perfectly in tune. See, that sounds slightly flat to me. That's good. That's good. That's good. So, yeah, as, I mean, I don't know. This, this is my project. I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I, I, I feel very strong about it because I do a lot of looping. And what happens is when you play, when you record your and loop your open chords down here, and then you take a solo up here, it can it can sound nasty. If those chords are playing and you're playing up here against that, it can sound really horrible because of the, because of the, the distance that you are from that, those notes. So I hope that makes sense. And then the hybrid picking thing, um, like I said, so... I realize I have been doing it. So what I'm doing is I'm using the pick. What I'll normally do in a gig is I'll strum songs. because I like the power of a pick, right? That's why I use the, the heavy pick. And then if I want to do something like Blackbird or a Travis picking song, I'll put the pick down physically and then... That's what I like to do. And I, and it took me, you know, I gotta say, just in case we've got people watching that are new to guitar, it took me a long time because I, 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 I grew up learning strumming songs like Oasis and all that stuff. So when I wanted to learn Blackbird, I really struggled. The first thing I did was I practiced something like an arpeggio, like Everybody Hurts by R.E.M. I found this so hard years ago. I found that this fourth finger was like, there was a tension here. And I literally just sat and just did this over and over again for hours. And, you know, what will happen is you've also got to learn to relax as well. Like, I'm a bit stressed right now because I'm live, right? You've got to remember to breathe and relax. Sorry if, you, sorry if I'm teaching you um, how, to, how to suck eggs. <laughs> right, but the hybrid picking, you hold the pick and you... I can't believe I never thought to do this before. It's awesome. And you get such a different sound when you don't use the pick. 
That's such a rounded sound with the with the thumb. And then with the pick, it sounds so different. Because because I'm using this finger, a different finger as well, so everything is mu has much more attack and snap to it. And then what's happening is I'm getting this blister here because the hand is resting. As I do that, I'm resting my hand against that low E string. So where it's where it's rubbing on the low E, I'm getting a blister. That's good though. But that would, that would turn to a callus. That's a good thing. Um, and then this nail is starting to break off here, where because I'm I'm playing so much, and it's catching against the high E string. So the nail's starting to break away. But it's awesome because it means you don't. You know, for a lot of songs, you don't have to put the pick down, right? You can go from... I love that. That's so cool. So, yes, yeah, so you can... You can start the song with finger start, and then... Yeah, very, 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 very cool. So does it, does it, if you're watching, do you do this? I can't, so I can't believe I haven't done it before. I had a lesson years ago when I was in Nashville with a country artist, and I asked him to teach me this. And I didn't want to do it, because I remember we did, I mean, that, that wasn't, this was a long time ago, and this wasn't too bad. Right, but I remember going to the G chord. At the time, I hated that, because that feels very weird, because you're stretching a finger you don't normally use, and you're stretching right across all those strings. So that I'm struggling with that one much more than, say, this. But I realized that I have actually been doing this um, at my gigs. When I take a solo, when I, when I do something like that, I actually, I, I realize I have been using my middle finger to pick notes. So if I do that line there, that was all with pick, but I, I realized recently I have actually been doing this. I've been picking that next string with the middle finger without realizing it. I've actually been doing hybrid picking. So that was my middle finger there. And a lick like that, or even the John Mayer licks. Um, I'm using the middle finger there. I'm not, I'm not picking it. I'm using the middle finger. And it just gives you a lot more speed, and it's just much easier. So I've actually been doing it subconsciously, but now I want to get to where it's... Um, it's always a problem when you do a song like The Boxer, and you do... I'm not going to get a copyright claim for this video, but... You know what I mean? You play all the verses like this. And then you get to the chorus, and I, you know, what, what are you going to do? You have to just literally... That's okay. Just hit with your with your nails, but um, if you do if you do hybrid picking, and then you can. So I think that's it. Could be a game changer. Uh, and even even just for the start of a song, you know, if you've got a song that builds and you want to just do some, just just so it's not strumming. I tend to strum a lot, you know, ninety percent of the time when I'm playing, when I'm singing. So now I can. Now I can do that. It'll break it. It'll make it more interesting. You know. Uh, and then this this pick thing here. So the John Mayer thing is he'll, but I I find this harder because that holding that like that is giving me um, tension there. And then he'll do that, but really fast. I think I might. I mean, you could. Uh, you could just hybrid pick it. So 
So I think hybrid pigging could be a really, really, really cool thing. Um, Jack said, hello, Aaron. What depth is your pick going into the string? This is what I, my favorite pick I always talk about on the channel, the Jazz 3 XL. Quickly, while we're here, people always say, why would you use a thick pick on the acoustic guitar? Well, this is my reasoning that a friend told me about years ago. If you use a thin pick, you can... It, it doesn't have any... There's nowhere to go, you know? It's just a thin... With the thicker pick, you get that loud... You can get that... You can hold it tight and get that loud, um, aggressive strumming. And if you hold it loose... Then you can get that kind of strumming too. It's, it's about how hard you grip the pick. So if you hold it really lightly... But then if you hold it tight and you can then then you can do things like so it's great for that kind of stuff when you hold it tight you have the you can take your lines i much prefer that than using a thin pick for that kind of stuff um, but then when I'm strumming, I hold it a little bit lighter. So I, I find it more versatile than a thin pick. I think it's good to have, it's good to have different picks if you're recording. You, get, you definitely get different sounds out of them. But for me, I just like the power of this. I just, I don't know, I, I, I can never go back. I love this thing. I've got lots of these. I change them out about once a month once they start to wear out. This one's starting to wear at the corners. And I just grab a new one. Prodigal Nation says, Digger picks are also warmer sounding with less attack. I use a 1.4 millimeter prime tone. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, um, wow. Yeah, this is a what? I think this is one. Is this one mil? I can't remember. It doesn't say on it. But I mean, look at that. It's it barely bends at all, right? So yeah, I can't believe this. I can't believe I haven't been doing this. I love it. I love when you discover something new that seems so obvious. I mean, maybe that's a bad thing. I don't know, but. this I think this could be a real game changer because I've always if I play a gig tonight, I'm just going to strum loop and solo, right? And then I'm going to put I'm going to put the pick away in my pocket and then do something like or I've been doing um James Taylor stuff, right? And I'd probably still do that that way. But at least now when I'm holding this and I'm strumming all my songs, if I just suddenly decide to do a different intro or something, just to break it up, just to make it more interesting for the listener. That'd be great. So if you start a song like that. Awesome. So I'm, I'm, yeah. If you haven't tried that, you should try it. But I, I will say I tried it a long time ago and I couldn't do it. Well, I'm talking about 15 years ago. So I'm um, just talking to anyone that's new to guitar. Don't be put off if some of this stuff it seems really hard because the fact of the matter is it is really hard. You know, I must have played Freight Train. I must have played that a million times before I could record a version of it. I had so much tension. You just got, if you, maybe you're lucky, maybe you have no tension. Maybe you find you can play this riff just fine. But if you can't, you will be able to. You just have to do it over and over and over and over and over <laughs> until you just don't want to play a guitar anymore. 
But then you take a break from that and you do some strumming for a few years you, and you, then you try again one day and you think, oh, actually, this is much easier than last time because when I did like practice a few years ago, I got my fingers got much stronger. That's not too bad, actually. But it's not perfect. I'm probably going to keep this guitar, and if I do, I'm actually, I might actually, if, if the other guitar comes back perfect, I might consider having stainless frets put in this and having it intonated. But we'll see. Don't walk before you can run, because they might not be able to fix the other guitar. We'll see. I'll let you know next week. All right, I'm switching back to the other view. One second. I just realized I had on the EQ of that Cole Clark, the bass and the middle were on zero, like all the way off. So don't judge the sound of the Cole Clark. Uh, I got a buzz. Don't judge the sound of the Cole Clark on that. One second. Because um, I, I never run it that way. I don't, I don't know why I did that. Or well, maybe it sounded fine. I don't know. Also, I didn't turn the mic, this mic off. So you're also hearing this mic as well. It might have sounded weird, but that guitar sounds very good plugged in. All right. So I just wanted to do that little thing because I, I sometimes I say things and I talk about things and I maybe people don't know what the heck I'm talking about. So by doing that, we're on the same page now. And that's so that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> uh, let me know what you think. <laughs> you think I'm crazy? I am crazy. That's why I'm here. That's fine. Okay. So back to the chat. Mad for it says still love. Still have the guitar, love the PG3 preamp, especially for percussion when using a looper, but not keen on the neck. So sadly, the guitar gets used for percussion, right? That was my review, right? The neck is extremely big. On the Cole Clarks, I find the necks vary a little bit. So I've played some that are very thin, and I think on their hybrid guitars, they do make them thinner um, intentionally to make them all like an electric. On the bigger guitars, it kind of varies. There is a kind of standard neck feel, but I've felt a lot of variation in it. So do try to play them before you buy them. But with um with the with this uh guitar you've got um Manchester um yeah those those necks were very they were the some of the biggest necks. So it's more like a classical neck. And I did put that in the video. I did tell them when I was at Nam as well. That was my feedback. I never heard back from them, so I guess, I guess it wasn't well received, but um <laughs> what can you do? I can only give my feedback, right? um yeah so you're right it's a great system and i still think it would be worth putting that system in another guitar if you wanted to so it's 84 in kentucky just fired up the ac i better i better clean out the acs here i've sold a lot of stuff this week i've got rid of so much stuff from the apartment and um i was actually watching a video with phil mcknight earlier talking about when you trade in the guitar center are they screwing you well, I made a video about that as well, and I said, no, they're not. And he said the same thing, I guess. You know, they're not because they buy it to then resell it. There has to be margin for them to make money as well. If you don't want them to do that and you want to get more money, you have to sell stuff yourself. That's fine. But he was saying that to the viewer, the question, do you value money or space more? And that really resonated with me because uh, having more space is a great thing. And I didn't realize that because I had a lot of stuff that I was storing, box, empty boxes, cases, cables I didn't need, old camera stuff, guitars, amps, speakers, all this stuff. So it's really nice to have, it's, it's nice to have the space. Not that I'm not that I'm not going to buy a guitar again at all, but um, I just needed to do like a like I needed to take stock. And I thought with the tax season coming around, it was a good time to do it. By the way, the tax deadline is tomorrow. Everyone logs off and does their taxes. <laughs> That's for America, by the way. America only. 
And no, I never did a video on taxes because people just find it extremely boring. So I'm sure other people have done them. So you're absolutely right, Quentin. It's getting very, very hot now. I like it. I went to the post office earlier and the sun was shining. I'm not complaining about it. But we do need to strike up the AC. Um, Al Alan, so like I said, I think you were, I think you were just, um, I think that was in a bit of humor there from you. But I, I wanted to put that in the stream today to show exactly what I mean. Because there's intonation and there's intonation, right? So. Uh, it's cold in England. That's why I'm not in England, you see. Hi, everyone. I'm busy arranging songs for a family funeral. Oh, sorry to hear that. Arranging songs for a family funeral. Won't be commenting. Okay. Sorry for your loss and um, wish, you know, thinking of you. Um, it's always tough to play at a funeral. I don't, I don't think I could do it. I've played, I've played at some, um, even the funerals I've played at where I didn't know the person, that was tough. So a family funeral, that's really tough. Um, Quentin says, playing live, I'd lick my pick and stick it to my cheek. Well, I knew a guy that used to put his fingers in his beer so the pick would stick to his fingers. But um, I don't recommend such things. Nick says, happy Monday. Good to see you, Nick. Paul says the James Taylor tuning helps. Yes. But like I said, that's a different thing. So if you get the Peterson tuner, it has a thing called sweetened tunings. You can select them from the menu on the tuner. And then you bait, effectively you get those James Taylor tunings. And that means that the, all the chords and the capo usage is more generally in tune with each, each of them. But yet that's not going to fix the problem with if you've got bad intonation at the 12th fret. Intonation at the 12th fret should be perfect. And then you do the sweetened tunings. Or you get the squiggly frets and the, the, the different nuts, compensated nuts. Uh, hi Boomer, good to see you. What model's the Cole Clark? That's my Angel Three. I did, I had it for sale for a while, but I don't want to lose a ton of money on it. No one was really interested. I did sell another guitar, but um, actually I've sold three guitars. But I'm I don't want to lose money on it, and I do like the guitar. I don't love the tuners, but you can replace them with the other kind of tuners that they use. That's pretty cheap. That's like a hundred bucks, and then um. The action is slightly too high, but having the action slightly lowered and the different tuners, I think I might. I've been gigging the mate in Nashville behind me, but I think I might go back to gigging that again. I, I like I like both of them for different reasons. And then when I get the one with the stainless steel frets back, I'll be gigging that to test out the stainless steel frets. And if I still adore the stainless steel frets, I may have them put on the Cole Clark. I don't know. I don't know yet. Or I might just play the mate in. the mate in with the steel frets is awesome too. Um. I have to see what makes sense. Love the guitar. Yeah, that is a that is a cool guitar. It's different. Michael says my friend has a fifty year old hummingbird. It's seemingly ne never in, seemingly seemingly never in tune when capo is put on, no matter where it's placed. To alleviate the assessor tune with each capo change. Yeah, I've had that too in the past with the mini maiden I had, but that was known to have poor intonation. They've actually got a split saddle now to fix that. So that can be different things, though. That that's also it's it, with the capo thing. It's important how you put it on. When you put the capo on the guitar and the kind of capo that you use, that's important too. But most people do retune when they put the capo on, especially if you're recording, because it does throw it out slightly. It's very hard to put a capo on a guitar and have it you know, this perfectly in tune and have it perfectly in tune when the capo is on the guitar. That's very difficult. Um, so I don't think it's a bad idea to retune, but most, most of my guitars won't go that bad out of tune where I have to retune them. I just, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to do it, but yeah, that sounds like, um, that might have some setup issues. Um, Jack, I answered your question. How to use the pick. Drill a small hole in the middle of the pick and put some string through it and tie a knot. Wrap the other end around the bridge pin and drop it. When That's actually a pretty cool idea. I would just have the spare picks on a pick holder on the mic stand. So if I drop one, I can just quickly grab one. I, I keep, you know that pocket in the jeans that's obviously for guitar picks? The small pocket in the, in the jeans pocket? 
I keep them in there because it's on the right side of my of my body and I'm right handed. So I, if I drop one, I just grab in there and grab one out. So I'm okay. But the string's not a bad idea. I thought you were going to say tie the other end around the middle finger so you can just drop it and then just grab it again. <laughs> it's actually not a bad idea. Nick says, I use that technique quite a bit. I also use the Maya technique, switching between pick and no pick a lot for electric. Yeah, I can't get that. It's the one, the one I can't really get. The, the, the Maya thing, I need to work on that some more to actually hide it and then pull it out again, hide it. Um, sounds great. You'll only get better. Thank you, Prodigal. I'm surprised how quick it came to me, honestly. I thought I'd be practicing what I did today for weeks and months, and it just kind of came together. The hardest thing is doing it for a long, you know, doing it for a whole song without making a mistake. Obviously, that's the, that's the thing that takes a lot of time. Building up the stamina. But I, actually, I thought I'd have a lot more issues with weakness in the fingers. I was quite, I was quite um, happy about that. Figure picks are also warmer standing. Yes, I agree. They do make a thicker sound, I think. But I think this one is a good compromise because it's not, I, th I think this is one mil. And it's nylon. So I don't know. I just, I, for me, it's, it's just perfect. I, 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 I like to try different ones. I've done videos on different ones, but I always come back to this one. Hybrid picking, hybrid picking makes so much sense. I stumbled into it when I was around 15. Yeah, I wish I had. I was very against finger style altogether because of the kind of music I grew up with. You know, I grew up on all the Britpop bands. They didn't do any of that stuff. They only strummed. They only used a pick in all their song releases. You never heard anyone doing finger style in the 90s. Not really. So I wish they had because I would have then done it. I would have learned that style sooner. Because they didn't, I tend, tended to stick to the, the pick, or the plectrum, the pick. Um, I, I agree. I agree. It's, it's silly. You know, you get people that say they can only play with the pick. You get people saying they can only play finger style. But to do both without putting the pick down is really cool. I can't believe how cool it is, actually. Hybrid picking with a thick pick combined with the thick pick makes you play with more dynamics which i think is important i agree like i said with the thicker pick you can play soft if you hold it lightly and you can hold it tight and dig in and play very aggressively so that's your range of dynamics whereas with a a thin pick you kind of just get light or light right a thin pick even if you hold it hard you can't dig it's flopping around on the strings i don't like that might try removing the pickup and installing it into a J200 inspired by Gibson will be keeping the PG3 system for sure. So one thing I will say, Ma um, Manchester, let me just put this out there. What if Cole Clark decide to do some other... What if, this is a what if, okay, for now. What if Cole Clark decide to do some other systems that don't require you to cut out the side of the guitar? Because to install that into your J200, I guess it's it's the inspired by, right? It's not like it's not like a ten thousand dollar guitar. And if you do like having the controls, maybe that's the right thing to do. I'm not against it. But what if Cole Clark decide to release a version that doesn't have the sidebanded preamp and just has a couple of controls in the sound hole? Now you might say, Well, I don't want that. I want them in the I want those. I like so I like controls on the side too. You might say that. But I think what they should do is release a version even further, because that would still have the battery and jack in the body of the guitar. I think Cole Clark should release a version with no holes required. So you literally have everything at noon on the controls and maybe just a volume wheel in the sound hole. The undersaddle pickup, the body sensor, the mic could be somewhere, could be relocated to say the end pin or something, or where those controls are, or something like that. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, and the battery inside the guitar, because the battery life on, on that PG3 is so long anyway. So I think they should release that system, and that would give the Anthem and all the other pickups a run for their money. 
that could be really great. I'm not going to say it'd be as great as the system in my Cole Clark. It won't be because that's built into the guitar. But a system like the PG3 without the controls with and, and the battery inside the guitar, I think that would be great. And I, I kind of hope that they'll, they'll do that. But I've heard nothing about that happening. So don't, don't, um, don't, don't wait around based on what I'm saying. That's uh, something that I've sort of mentioned, but, but, um, I've mentioned that they, they should do, uh, they may not do it. So yeah, I agree. All the guitars I've tried the PG three in that are not Cole Clark's still sound really good. So I would do it, but I'm not going to do it because I've got the Cole Clark. And like I said earlier, the system built into the Cole Clark for me is the ultimate. And that's why I'm not going to do it. But if someone is just dead set against buying a custom Martin colorway and putting that system in it, I wouldn't stop them because I think that'd be a heck of a guitar. One of the best things about the Guitar Center trade is that the risk of loss... Let me come a bit closer here. The risk of loss and hassle of shipping, especially acoustics, is eliminated. I agree. No one, no one really picked up on that when I did the video about it. It's, it's great that you can just grab something, grab a bunch of things, Walk up to the Guitar Center, trade them in. They give you cash. You know, you have to sign everything, but they give you cash in hand. You get 10% off any other purchases you want to make, and you go home, and you're done. Like, I'm currently, I've just shipped a pedal. I sold a pedal to a guy, USPS, and it's stuck somewhere, and it says it's delayed. And he was upset, which is rightly so. I said, don't worry. Reverb will make it right. Reverb are great in that respect. I paid for the insurance. This will all be fine. If it does end up saying it's lost, you'll get your, all your money back from Reverb Insurance. That's fine. But that is a hassle in itself. And that's a hassle that I wouldn't have had if I just walked up the Guitar Center and said, here you go. They would have, they would have probably given me $75 less for the pedal. But I wouldn't have to be dealing with this stuff. And that is worth, that's worth something. That is worth money too. I don't think people think about that. Time is money. And that's important. And sometimes you just want to grab. I did it today. I took a load of stuff to the, the local donation center. I just grabbed two big boxes. I took them down there. I gave it to them. I felt good about myself. The place feels more clear. I feel more clear. I'm done. Now, could I have sat on eBay or Facebook Marketplace and made myself $100 from that? Yes. But I don't want to be doing that. I want to be doing other things that I want to be doing. So that, that does have value for sure. But yes, is it, what is the ultimate way to make money from things you're selling? The ultimate way to make money from things that you're selling is to sell it yourself. In the same way that the ultimate way to save money setting up your guitar is to set it up yourself. But it's the same thing. I don't want to go to school and learn how to shape a nut for perfect intonation. I, I would rather send it to someone like Sweetwater to, 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 to do it. And also they have the Plex machine and I kind of want the guitar Plex as well. And that's all, it's also changed my mind. You know, sometimes I give them a hard time that when they sell a Martin, they say you can pay to have it plecked. And I say it's already, already been plecked. Yes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't just have the guitar plecked again with the same strings and setup that they were going to send it with anyway. But I would, I do now see the value in saying, hey, that's got 13 gauge strings and, the, and their, their action, the factory action. I want... 10 gauge strings with a high action i don't know why you'd want that but if you did want something like that that wouldn't hurt to have it replaced again especially in more detail i mean martin don't sit there and at the plec machine for for six hours on each guitar and plec it do they they put it in there and they get it within spec and they ship it out so i've kind of changed my mind a bit on that as well the only thing i don't like is that they said they wouldn't give me a printout of what was actually wrong with the plec you know with the, with the setup, the frets from the Plex machine. Because I've seen videos where they've said, look, this guitar doesn't need a Plex. So my only question that I will present to Sweetwater as part of this video is what happens in that instance? Do you tell the customer it doesn't need it? Because how would I ever know? I, I'm being a little bit skeptical here. I have to be. I'm, I'm trying to be balanced and everything. But that's one question I will ask them. Like, Do you actually say that this guitar, have you said to customers this guitar doesn't need a Plex? or it wouldn't really benefit from it. So I understand they're not giving out the actual data sheets and printouts because I don't think anyone does, but it'd be nice at least to have some kind of summary sheet that says, 
hey, we, the plague was done and the main issues were the third threat was too low, the sixth threat was too high, it was creating a buzz. That's what I want some information. Maybe they do that. I don't know. I've never had this done before. So that's part, all part of my video. Chris says, I'm having a hard time selling a few things on Reverb. I think I might go the trade in for credit at Guitar Center route. Yeah, I, I've had a good week. I've sold loads of stuff on there. All priced. I, I started the pricing very fair, you know, very or fair. Let's say fair. And then a few things sold right away. The few things that didn't sell that would be on watch, I dropped it to very fair. Like you'd be silly not to buy it. And they sold. A couple of things I got on there haven't had any interest at all. No watches, no offers, no messages, nothing. I do notice that everyone likes to make you a lower offer. I, I don't, I'm not going to hate on that because I do it myself. I think it's human nature. It's what we do. But it is kind of annoying when you know that this thing you've got is basically brand new and you're and you're listing it way below a new price and they still want to knock you down. But then again, you can't blame people for trying and I just say no. I just say, look, I got free shipping. It's not been used. <laughs> this is a great deal. You won't find this anywhere else. So, and also I just listed it. So, you know, maybe come back in two weeks. That's what stores say, right? Actually, I asked the, I asked the store for a discount a few weeks ago. And they said, maybe if it was six months from now, we would do that. But as we just got it, we're not willing to do that. That's the same mentality. That's fair enough. Danielle says, use ban the box this morning. Reminded me the first videos I saw from you were related to ban the box. Using it to try and few fix a few player timing problems. Yeah, I've been using the metronome lately. I haven't used ban the box for years. I got it. I loved it. I still do love it. I think it's great. I think it's a bit antiquated at this point. I think they could do a more modern interface. It's it's a you know it's that kind of program where if you don't use it for a while and you come back to it, you just kind of forget what how it works. At least I do. Um, but I did some cool thing. I mean, my my theme song for the first three you know throughout the pandemic was all made on Band in the Box. So I could I could have done a lot more with it too. I could have done a lot more. And it does. I'm being a bit harsh here. It does do things that other software can't do. You know, you can record a decent demo with it. If you can't play drums and bass, you can get a good demo. Some people have released albums made with Band in the Box. I just think, for me, it's that it, I feel like I'm on the endless train of having to up, upgrade every year. You don't have to, but I got the stage where when I was sorting through stuff the other day, I found like five different versions of Band in the Box. It's like well, every year they release these new updates, and you feel you want to get them, and you get them, and then I don't have actually, I never actually use those ones. There's other updates that I want. And I just find the whole thing to look a bit kind of, um, oh, I want, I want, it's very, very um, shallow, but I want it to look more modern. But yeah, the thing is, there's not, there's not much else around there like it. So what are you going to do, right? But I haven't used it for a long time. Um, a watch pocket. I wish I'd learned, oh, for the jeans. I wish I'd learned hybrid picking earlier. It's it's hard to unlearn bad habits. I agree. I'm learning a song now, and I'm making sure I stick to the tab. Yeah, I've got to the tab and the sheet, the sheet music uh, right in front of me at all times, and I'm making sure I learn it correct because there's nothing worse than spending 100 hours learning something wrong and then having to spend another 100 hours relearning it. And it's really difficult at that point because it's in your brain, right? So I'm trying to learn some songs now from scratch, absolute scratch. Like the, not something I've really done before. So I go through bar by bar, listen to the vocal, listen to the guitar, match them up. Pretty cool. I'm enjoying it. So it sounds like everyone does hybrid picking. It's just me that wasn't doing hybrid picking, which is cool. Uh, hello, I'm back. I love to play finger style, but I've been learning to play with a pick in the last couple of years. I think you need both skills. Have you, Lee? Have you tried hybrid picking, where you hold, you have the pick and and you have the pick and you finger pick, <laughs> which I did earlier. Used to do a lot of finger picking, but now like some of the older flat plectrum styles. Barney Kessel. Uh, love all the recordings Judy London made with Barney. If I had to choose one style, it'd be strumming. Because I find if I'm playing a bar gig and I'm doing, I'm, I'm, 
want to play up. I don't want to play all mellow stuff. I want to play upbeat songs. Then I need the pick. So I'm always going to use the pick. But if I can start doing hybrid picking with it, that'd be great. Did you find that Guitar Center was rather selective at what they will purchase? Some shops will thumb their nose. Anything isn't collectible vintage. No, the thing the thing about me is I'm trying to learn. You know, a lot of stuff I do, I try to justify with the YouTube channel. I can do that to an extent because it is now a part time job for me. But I have this bad habit of buying stuff. Well, there's two things. One thing is I'm very careful with my things. You know, I look after my stuff. So even if you buy a guitar from me that I've gigged for a year, it'll still look in great shape, right? Of course, it's got to have um, some dings and fret wear and all that stuff, regular stuff. But it'll be in great shape for the fact that I've gigged it for a year. So if you buy something off me that I've only used here in this room, it's probably going to be brand new and or as good as new. And also, I, I was keeping the boxes too. I, I generally keep most of the boxes for stuff. So when I took about five items a few months ago and made that video to Guitar Center, uh, they took them all. And I, I was pretty happy with the money. Uh, yeah, of course, of course, I'd have made more if I'd sold it myself. But to take five things at once that I couldn't sell and to get that money in my hand and walk out the door, I, I, I would do it again. But only with certain things. Like I would never take. Let's say I was going to sell the Cole Clark, this this Angel Three, right? I would never take that there. That would be a horrible decision. They'd probably give me about fifteen hundred for that guitar, and they'd sell it for twenty five, twenty six, something like that. So I'd never do that because if I really had to sell that guitar, I could get twenty five for it easy. Um. But. That's not a great example because Cole Clarks don't really hold. Well, I say they don't hold their value. I've, I've, I did sell one this week. So I think they do. It depends. Like everything else, it depends who's, you know, who's, who's looking, doesn't it? That's what it all comes down to. By the way, I love the way it looks. I love the way that guitar looks behind me. I keep looking at it. The way the gold is um, sparkling and the light is sparkling off the tuner and the inlay there. I really like that. Hmm. I might, might have to have that guitar set up. It's just had a slightly high saddle since I got it. So I might have to have some work on that and start gigging it. But no, they took everything that I took in there. But it, like I said, it was all kind of mainstream stuff and it was all in very good condition. Some of it had the box as well. But they took everything. I can understand if you walk in there with a, a beaten up old speaker from 10 years ago and no box, no manual that's the other thing you've got to remember is they look at their inventory. Okay. So if you take in a PA speaker, they will look that up in the use section. And if they've got hundreds of them, they won't take it or they'll offer you less because they'll also look at the prices those are selling for. So if there's a hundred and they haven't sold in a long time and the other stores have dropped the prices because Guitar Center do drop the price on the gear after a certain time, they lower the price gradually. So if they see the price has lowered that down and there's hundreds of them, they may take it but offer you even less than that. So you're getting a very small amount. Or they might they might say, no, we've just got too many in the system. We're never going to sell it. We need to sell some. So there's definitely products that are more desirable to them than others. But with me, they took all my stuff, I think because of the condition and because it was all stuff that they didn't have like tons of. And there was one thing they had tons of them, but they still took it because of the condition. As you said, time is money, so Sweetwater probably wouldn't want to, want to not pluck it, even if it didn't need it. Right. I understand that to a degree, because I watched another store talk about the pleck, and they, they would tell customers if it didn't need it. They would charge them a fee to look at it. That's what they should do. They should say, right, you want your guitar plucked? <clears throat> it's, it's $75 for us to put it through the machine and look at it. Because that's that is work. They have to load it in, look at the results, all that kind of stuff. So even a hundred, even a hundred dollars, because a plec and a setup is four hundred. So they could say, right, hundred dollars, and if it doesn't need it, then we'll just do the setup, and your total fee is three hundred. But if it does need it, then it's four hundred, and we plec it. Something like that, something along those lines. I think would be fair. 
but that's just me. I like to know what's going on, you know, because I do the, the YouTube stuff. So I see both sides of that. And I still think the Plek is a bit of a gamble. But when I watch the videos of them doing it, I think it's really cool. And I see the value. I wish I could see it being done. I really, on my guitar. I really do. That would be great. I'd also love to get a guitar that's been plecked, like the Cole Clark or a Martin, and have someone run it through a pleck and tell me how well that pleck was done. Because Martin plecked their guitars and they're, they're, they're really good. I've, I've, I, think the play, I really think the setup and playability of Martin guitars is great because they do so much robotic stuff now and they use the pleck and everything. I really think it's helped the guitars and I think that's a good thing. But I'd still like to have one and put it on a machine and see if it's been done to the best it could have been done. I mean, that's a, that's a bit fussy because, like I said, I find that they play really well. I find the Cole Clarks play really well, but like on this one, the saddle's slightly too high. So that's not the plick. That's just the saddle height. That's a different thing. But I just, I just like to know, you know, the ins and outs of all this stuff. <laughs> probably, I probably want to know too much, to be honest. Uh, different topic. We started using bicycle tire tubes as guitar straps. Game changer. Versatile, not stiff. Huh. Well, I guess that doesn't slip on your back and it's soft, right? Especially for like a heavy electric guitar. You can make a business out of that for sure. If you can't find issues with a fret rocker, I would be inclined not to send the guitar in to be leveled and plecked. Yeah, I agree. I did get a the, the leveler from um, uh, Stu Mac. That's good. So you just rock it on the frets and you can see if, it, if it's moving, that means there's a gap. So it's, it's not level. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, although the, the plec... The Plec does do it to an even smaller, you know, uh, minute amount, which some may feel affects the overall playability of the guitar. But I get what you're saying. If the fret rocket ain't moving, then your fingers probably aren't going to notice the difference. I agree. Yeah, I'm still undecided about the Plec. That's actually why I'm having the guitar Plec. The guitar I sent them doesn't need a Plec. It just needs the D-string intonated. It plays incredibly. It plays like an electric. It's amazing. Like the stainless steel frets and the, the action they set up Maiden is amazing. Like it, it almost it's almost too easy to play to the point where I want it to be harder to play. So the only reason I'd have that plect really is for a video, is to say like I played this for a month. That's why I gigged it. I gigged it for a month, sent it to them. I want to be like, okay, did the plect make a noticeable difference or or not? And even then I won't really know because they're gonna change the setup anyway, aren't they? So I just kind of want to do that just to see. And then in regards to intonation, I don't think the plec is going to help that. I think the the the, the um, bridge is going to affect the intonation, the way they shape the new bridge. So Lee spends an hour with the fret rocker getting my own guitars right. I don't think you need anything else. Yeah. I, I, I do agree. I, I feel like the, the lasers and the computers can do this stuff way more accurately than we can with a fret rocker. But I also agree that if the fret, fret rocker isn't moving, you're probably not going to notice those differences. I don't know. This is so hard to tell without having the guitar in your hands and then have it plecked and then in your hands. I kind of treat it more as just part of the setup. So the reason I like the fact that Sweetwater have one is that they can use it and then set it up. Does that mean it will be a good set? We don't know. I don't know yet. I don't know until I get it. I've not had them set up an acoustic for me like this before. So I don't know. That's why I'm doing the video. But it's, it definitely adds a lot of extra expense, and that's got to be taken into consideration as well. Nick says, maybe I missed it. Did you ever get your hands on the Martin Inception after NAM? No, and I've kind of lost interest, to be honest. Um... I feel like I could ask to review it if I wanted to. But I don't know. I still really like the. I, I, I want to try the SC28E Anthem. That's what I want to try. But I know the neck will be too thin for me. So the Inception on paper is the better guitar. 
I have a, I have a few issues. My first issue with the Inception is that hype that they had was it just it just killed it, didn't it? The the hype of saying this is going to re change the game of guitars, and then to release a guitar made from sustainable wood, that was I'm sorry, I love Martin, but that was way overhyped. I know we have to do hype. People do clickbait. People have to do headlines and hype things up for publicity. But when you hype something that much, it can also backfire and cause disappointment. If they just simply released that guitar and said, this is a GPC with the anthem and we're using some different woods, I think it would have been a lot better. I think to tease two weeks before or a month before and then to say what they did and then release that, I just, it really, it really did something to my brain. <laughs> Um, and the other thing is, to be completely honest, for me, I wouldn't buy one and keep it because it's not going to be like the Cole Clark. I mean, look, I've got these two guitars behind me are, are basically GPCs, and the pickup system, the AP5 Pro and the PG3, are two of the best systems in the world. So I think it's a shame, though, because the thing about the Inception is the weight is amazing. It's a pound lighter than those guitars. And I like light guitars. So the weight is great. The pickup is great. It's the Anthem. I do think it's expensive at four. I wouldn't pay $4,000. And I, I do think they could have done something new if they just put stainless steel frets in that guitar. That would have been a game changer. Because once again, you're probably, you get sick of me saying this. No one's using stainless steel frets. No one. Mating on, mating on one model. So if the Inception had just been Hey everyone, we're using some local wood, we're trying some different things with the bracing, and we're putting stainless steel frets in this. I probably and, and it's thirty five hundred dollars. I probably would have one right now. But the way it was hyped and doesn't really add anything new physically, like with stainless steel frets or a new pickup system or anything like that, it just kind of it just it's left a bit of a taste in my mouth. It really has. So yeah, and I don't know. I'm not. I've also not seen people talk about them either, at all. Um, let's see if they're available right now on Sweetwater. So maybe when the dust settles, maybe I will um, review one at some point. It says they're back ordered, so they have. So there's no demos. So I guess they are selling. Oh no, here we go. So Sweetwater have two demos in stock. So I don't know what that means. Look, just be transparent. That could mean that the guitars were used. For promo and they're selling them they're only they're only 300 they're only 200 bucks cheaper it could mean that they were demoed in the shop or it could mean that people returned them make of that what you will um one of them is four pounds three ounce which is awesome and the other one is four pounds seven ounce which is basically a cole clark a light cole clark so that doesn't, doesn't interest me as much but if that guitar was four pounds three ounces and had stainless steel frets and wasn't overhyped i would want one but I just think I didn't like that campaign. That was too much. I have to say it. I really, I really feel that. If you have the guitar partially refretted, you have to have it played. You don't have to have any guitar plaked at all. Um, it's, it's, and it's, I think it's something that we're still kind of figuring out if this is worth it or not. I know that Sir don't play. Sir have incredible fret work. PRS have incredible fret work. They don't use a plaque machine. You don't need to use one. But Martin guitars play great out of the box and they are plecked. Is it related? I don't know. Fender don't pleck and some of their setups are pretty naff from what I've had. And some of them are great. So I'd be pretty bummed if I paid the $400 for a setup and pleck and I got a guitar from Sweetwater that was already playing great anyway. That's a total waste of money. The best thing to do is to get the guitar, play it, and then if you love the guitar, then send it back and have all that done. But that's a hassle. So I don't know the answer to this. The plec is only accurate if you use the same strings every time. If you change make or size, the plec will not be accurate. But this is the problem. This is what I noticed the other day. I put... I, I put... I had Martin... I was just saying, Lee, when you, when you, before you came on, I had Martin's uh, authentic acoustic strings on the Dreadnought I have. And... It was perfectly intonated. I put a set of um, the 
uh, XS strings on and the D was flat. So I think ideally, I was, I was thinking about this after that. I think ideally, if you're really fussy, what you would do is you would decide on the exact brand and gauge string that you want to use and you'd have that guitar plecked and set up. I think that is about as good as it can get. Even then, Plex themselves will say it's all about the person operating the machine. Just because you have a Plex machine, you don't just throw the guitar in and it spits out a guitar that's perfect. You load it in, it gives you the measurements. Then you work with it, basically, to say how much to do, and it does it. It can do you know different amounts, and then it gives you another printout, and you decide if it's within the tolerance that you want, if you want to go further. So this is still down to the person operating the machine. So I think in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, you have, you get your guitar, you make sure you like it, then you choose 100% the string brand style and gauge that you want to use. And then you send all that to someone like, I don't, I've not recommend them yet because I haven't tried the guitar, but someone with a plec and you have it plec and set up all that stuff done. And then you stick with those strings and you should be, that's about as best you'll get it. If you want to get really in the weeds, that's how you do it. And I assume that's why the excess strings are not intonated right on the Martin where the Martin strings are because they have a different um, tension and things like that. And not the same, they're not exactly the same. I have a fret rocker I like from a company called <clears throat> Vonsmont, Vonsmont, satin black with a heavy gauge, then some. Also has easy to read white marking on satin black for string heights. Nice. I got the um, Stu Mac. I really like the Stu Mac tools. I got the Stu Mac guitar calipers. They're fantastic. Yes, they're 70 bucks. The ones on Amazon are 10 bucks. These ones work so much better and it's so much easier to use. They're worth every penny. Do you have any acoustic guitar pickups you want to sell? Um, do I? I'll email you if I do. I think I might have a couple actually. I'm, I can't think. I did sell some. I had a whole box of acoustic guitar pickup parts and pickups, and I just got I, I wanted that box gone, so I just got rid of it. <laughs> I'm like, why am I going to use pieces of certain systems? I'm not going to use them. I just keep, uh, like everything else, I was keeping it for a video. If I had to show a certain part of a certain pickup for some reason, but that's never going to happen. And it's, you know, it's just not worth it. So I'll let you know. I think I might, I think I'm thinking I do have one, but I can't think what it is. It's not an anthem or anything like that. So um, I'll email you. I've got your email, Rex. So I'll let you know if I'm selling, if you're, if you're, I don't know if you're interested. Nick says, I agree. I kind of think with all that hype they put into it, they kind of flop once in the market. I just think, I don't want to say flop. You know, I, I played it at NAMM. It felt great. And I love the weight. And I love the fact that it's got the anthem in there. I love a lot of things about it. I love the inlay. I'm looking at it now. I love the inlays and everything. I think it's cool. But that hype, you remember my videos before that guitar was released. It was crazy. Looking back, I was a fool. I was like, wow, what's it going to be? Is it going to be a new pickup system? Of course, no, it wasn't. Is it going to be stainless steel fret? No. Is it going to be a brand new brake? No, it, it wasn't. It was just a tweak on a, on a classic, which is fine. So just say that. And then they didn't even mention, they didn't hype up the SC28E at all. And then that came out and blew my mind. I was like, this is great. An SC guitar. I don't know if, I, don't know if I'd like it or not. I don't know if I'd like the neck. And I need to try one. Um, but... And, and it still doesn't. It still, it still doesn't have the stainless steel frets, or even the Evo gold frets, or anything like that. But I think that was a more important thing, and it wasn't overhyped. It was just at the show, and it was just a cool guitar, Nazareth made SC twenty eight. Great. So I know I don't know what, what was going on there. One thing I have trouble judging is the other frets above the twelfth fret. That's the that's the video I was watching. They said. The Plec machine said above the 12th fret on, the, on this acoustic guitar, this Gibson, that the frets were off. But they, they, the guy said, I'm not going to do it because what's the point of redoing the whole guitar for a part of the guitar that you're not going to play? 
And I totally agree with that. It doesn't make any sense. And that's why I want to know what was actually wrong with the guitar. Do you think the legacy companies get discouraged that when they branch out and try new things, people seem to push back and only want the classics? Well, I don't think that's true at all. Because Martin released the SC guitars, and they're apparently they're really popular. Everyone gives the Acoustic Sonic a hard time, but I see loads of people playing them. They're really popular. Yes, they made too many. Yes, I think they could make it better personally, with with better, you know, even more futuristic features. But they are very popular. It's only people on forums that say they were a flop. They're not a flop. So you have to be you have to be careful with that stuff. I do think it's a thing. Look at Martin. They they can't get rid of the D18 because the D18 is their classic. That's what people expect. But there's absolutely no reason why they can't have a D18 and an SC28. And that's what they're doing. They have the SC18, the D18. Um, Fender have the Acoustasonic and they have the Strat and the Tele. So I don't think it's really a problem. I think a lot of people criticize the companies. I don't think they should because I think that companies i've said this a lot i think companies should do more to push the envelope i was watching a video on the firebird x gibson guitar i think it's kind of cool people really slammed that into the ground i think it's great that gibson did something fresh i hate this boring old stuff almost swore i hate the boring old stuff that we see every week it's the same old thing every week yeah, i mean the, the inception it's not new it's it's a it's a gpc 28e basically isn't it it's a light gpc 28e with a different sound that's what it is is the sc 28 for me i don't think so but i'm glad they did it because if you do play electric and you like a thin neck and you want an adjustable neck that's a guitar for you and you can still go on there and buy an om28 and did you know, I found this out recently as well, and something that I'm considering. You can order a custom shop Martin guitar with stainless steel frets. So no one talks about that. But I think it's amazing that they offer that. No one will do it because everyone wants to buy the classic D18 with the nickel frets. But the fact that they'll do you a um, custom shop guitar with stainless steel frets is great. It's very modern. It's very forward thinking. So I think as long as companies don't kill off the old product lines and keep them, as long as they keep those around and do the new things, that's, that's the way it should be. And I think that's what most companies do. I do think that you're right, though. When someone announced, a company like Martin announced a new model with slightly different specs, the first thing people do is look down on it. And they have to get through that. Not always, but often. They have to get through that thing. And I do think I'm at $4,000 for the inception, I mean, for $4,000, you could get an OM28 with an anthem in it. So you're really paying that money. At the end of the day, you're paying that money really for the colorway and the slightly bigger body. So I, I do think that guitar could have been a little bit more affordable, personally. This is all in hindsight. Hindsight is a wonderful thing. And I don't know if I'm right. They may have sold millions of them. I don't know. We'll find out at NAM if they release another model or not. That will tell us um, how many they sold. There's always going to be purists and people who want something new. The thing is, Lee, I, I want both. I, I always say that. You know, I want to have a classic old Strat, a classic old Gibson, a classic Martin. I mean, I tried the authentic. I sold my, my Triple O Authentic. That was a great guitar. I played it before I shipped it out. Great guitar. The Authentics are amazing. The D28 that I sold, I just didn't get on with the neck. And Dreadnoughts to me a bit too big anyway. The Triple O was amazing. But I decided to let it go because I wasn't using it. And um, that was that was a custom shop one, though, that had the modern neck, which is interesting. That didn't have the vintage neck. It had a modern neck. That was like a hybrid, really. But they still offer that. They still offer the original thing, recreated. And I think that's great. But I like authentic, and I like modern, and sometimes I like something in between. So I still like just a Martin Standard Series guitar. I think they're great. I take that over a vintage guitar, I think, in general. But with like with a Fender, I'm I want to buy a classic Strat. I want to have a classic Strat, and then if I'm doing a gig, I'd rather have something like a Sir with noiseless pickups and a splittable pickup because it's more versatile. So I really I really like both things. I like the old and the new. 
Um, but I get it. Some people just want the old, and that's why they still offer those original guitars. And some people just want the new. The biggest problem is if brands don't do the new stuff. Can you imagine if Martin only made D18s and D28s and OM28s and refused to make anything else? That's going to be a problem. Well, actually, maybe not, because I bet that's what they mostly sell. But long term, that could be a problem. Someone like Cole Clark, they told me their biggest seller is the true hybrid. So their, their main seller now, most popular guitar, is that, that, that hybrid, super modern um, guitar. That's their market. But they are more of a modern company, so I kind of get it. That's a great question, though. I like that one. Thank you, Nick. Um, be on the lookout, too. This week is the NAB show, uh, the broadcasting show. So there's been a few microphones announced and some audio equipment announced this week. So check out that show if you're online. Paul says, from what I've been told, stainless steel is... Oh, don't, Paul, don't get me started on stainless steel frets. I'm, I'm getting really mad about it. Yes, it is harder on tools. But if you're a luthier, you could just charge me to buy new tools. I would do it. And I always say, you know, um, Sir, work exclu almost exclusively with stainless steel. They haven't got a problem. Um, most of the carbon fiber guitars use stainless steel. They haven't got a problem. I I don't know. I, I'm I'm yeah. That's it's a, that's a tough point for me. I'm at the stage now where I don't want to buy a guitar with nickel frets because I figure if I like the nickel frets, I'll play it, and if I play it, I'll wear the frets out, and then I've got to have it refretted. So yeah, that, that's gonna, there's going to be a video on this. I'm just getting I'm taking my time on the stainless steel frets video for acoustic. Because I don't want to just blurt something out and not really think. I want to really play the guitar with the stainless steel frets. Really process my thoughts before I unleash that. I don't want to like, have to retract the video. <laughs> Did you get the drums? No. The, so, thank you. Um, the Joe Robinson has been at Sweetwater for nine days and they said it would take two to three weeks to look at it and then they'll start the work on it so i should have more information next week or the week after yeah man the time's gone really quick i can't believe it's been an hour and a half already <laughs> so yeah i'm excited to get that back too but i'm also nervous that they won't be able to fix the intonation or something i tell you what if they don't i might try one more time with someone else i just i really need to know it's driving me a bit, a little bit nuts. So it'll all be worth it, I think. I think in a two or three months, I'll have some videos about all this stuff and it will be useful because I've not seen any other videos about this. I think it'll be useful information just to find, figure this stuff out. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really kind of getting into the, into the, into the, the nitty gritty of this stuff. Nitty gritty. But uh, it's important to me, you know. I, I, the, the more, the more you look into something, the more things you find. And I want to know this stuff. I want to know, like, two companies not use stainless steel frets because people don't want them, or because they'll wear out their machinery. Or my theory is, your guitar will last forever, or certainly last a lot longer than it does now. There's a lot of people out there who'll tell you that their frets wear out in a year and they have to get a refret and spend money. I've tended to sell those guitars and buy a new one. Imagine if your frets never wore out. How many less guitars and you'd buy and how much less work you'd have done on your guitar by the luthiers. I, th I, I think it's a little bit of a conspiracy. I do. But I'm happy to admit that I'm wrong. And we'll find out. It certainly does feel different. I'll tell you that. Stainless steel frets are slippery and easy to play. That I, could, I can understand why someone might want the resistance of the nickel frets. Now, nickel frets that are highly polished are also slippery and easy to play, but the stainless steel frets never get tarnished, whereas the nickel frets will get tarnished. You have to constantly polish them. So that's another thing. You don't have to keep polishing the frets. There's just there's just a lot of a lot of little little things about the stainless steel frets. Plecking is perfect for stainless frets. And yes, and and you can put the stainless frets in a pleck. And and of course, like you say, if they do the setup on that guitar with the stainless frets, they won't wear. 
it's a bit off-putting to me to have a guitar plecked with nickel frets and then in a year you then have the frets redone and then you're going to pluck it again it's just all it's all that's the money pit i want a guitar that i can just maintain myself you know i want a guitar that's well built um all i gotta do is humidify it it's been plucked and stainless steel frets and i can just grab it and play it maybe adjust the neck occasionally and i'm done that's what i want i don't want to be messing around with sending guitars out to have refrets and all this sort of stuff i don't want that see look i have to refret three or four times a year i play every day and have a very bad hard touch right i don't want to deal with that i i'd say i have to ref. i actually haven't had a refret i just wear them out they you see the wear in them after about 14 months with me if i gig it so i just want a gigging guitar that that won't happen with I'm I'm also doing it as part of the video for a video as well. You know, I want to I want to I want to cover stuff that other people don't talk about. No one's talking about intonation. No one's talking about stainless steel frets for acoustic. So maybe no one cares. But I want to I want to make the video because that matters to me, and that's the kind of stuff that I want to make. So I'm very excited to get it back. I really did enjoy gigging the guitar. I really did. And no one said to me, "Oh, your guitar sounds bad," or "Your guitar sounds bright," or I've said before, the guitar does sound bright because of the woods they use basically so that's why the final step for me is having a guitar refretted with the stainless steel frets to see what the actual difference is but that is scary because what if they chip the, the fretboard or something and that's why i think companies should just use them from the factory from day one but we'll see i'm still figuring this out it'd be funny if next year's nam is all about stainless steel frets and all, all the companies are saying hey everyone check out our new guitars they've got stainless steel frets they'll last forever <laughs> that's the kind of thing that happens in business right they use it as marketing Aaron prefers well actually I don't know yet I've been gigging one guitar with stainless steel frets I've been gigging it and the intonation was bugging me which is why I'm having it looked at I'm going to say yes because of the smooth feel ease of play and the fact they won't wear out but they they uh, they feel so different on that guitar to nickel frets that I can see why some people might not like them. Maybe I don't know. I need to play a couple two 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 or, two or three other guitars before I really know, because maybe it's just that guitar, right? So I don't want to say I pref oh. I prefer them for gigging because they won't wear out. But I don't know if they're the be and end all yet. I don't. I'm not. I don't want to sit here and rave and rave and rave about them. And then decide that actually I still like nickel frets for some things as well. That's why I'm being on the fence. I don't want to. I don't want to do the hype thing where I just like constantly go on about it because I don't know how I feel yet. But I do think they're awesome, and I think it's pretty sad that more companies don't use them for sure. And I think that would have been the perfect thing for the inception. The st stainless steel frets. Here's a new guitar, modern stainless steel frets. That would have been. It would have been something different, you know. What's your favorite delay and reverb pedal? Well, lately I'm just using the Quad Cortex for everything. Now, is that the best reverb and delay? No. But is it the best small all-in-one unit? Yes. For me, yes. It's great. Um, but if you want to ask me for a pedal, for acoustic or electric, William? Because if it's for acoustic, you can, I mean, you know, you can use any reverb pedal on any guitar but fishman and bags do make really nice reverb pedals for acoustic that have a kind of blend thing built in so you get the, the true signal pass through as well the dry signal um i like those and then in the past i've only really used things like the tc hall of fame i've never got into the strymon and the fancy reverb units um i do like the ua stuff the ua Delay and reverbs are really nice, but they're big pedals. They're expensive. So for my needs, when I play acoustic, I use what's built into the TC Helicon Voice Live 3 Extreme. I think that sounds great. i got no problem with it. And when I play the electric, I use the Quad Cortex ones. I think they're great. I've got no problem with them. The Quad Cortex doesn't have that drippy um, spring reverb which the, like they have that in the Bender one, the Tone Master Pro has an amazing 
spring reverb that the that the quad cortex does not have so i will say that uh, i miss that for sure and then as far as the big fancy crazy um uh reverbs there's some good ones in the hx stomp but i just don't really use those myself For electric, yeah. Well, so like I said, in the past, I've, for a mini pedal, I've used um, Hall of Fame Mini just for a basic reverb. And I've used some delays that I didn't like. I can't remember what they're called. Uh, I do want to have a tap tempo on it for sure. I, I did try the, the Universal Audio ones. They are really good, but they're on the bigger side and not very flexible. Honestly, for me, an HX stomp just for reverbs and delays alone would probably be re more than enough. And like I said, I was really impressed with that Tone Master Pro Spring Reverb, if you get a chance to try that. But I wouldn't buy one just for that, but that was really good. And since I've been shopping, I've got there's a load of new ones too. But also the Quad Cortex is so small, you could have that just for those wet effects. I'm using that with my amp now, just those wet effects sometimes, or use it as a whole rig. But they are not the best in the world because they haven't. They need to develop them a bit more. So it's a an unfinished product, as they say. All right, Lee, take care, my friend. I'll talk to you soon. All right, I'm going to wrap things up. It's five thirty. I've got to do some more sorting out. Um, yeah, so I uh, hope today's um, stream was interesting. I wanted to show you the what I've been working on on the guitar, and um, I can't think I've got any more news coming up. Just some things I'm working on that I'll reveal um, when they're ready. Uh, hopefully next week I can tell you about the cult, the uh, maiden that went in for the plec, um, hopefully. And uh, if not, it'll be the week after for sure. So, And also, yeah, talking about the quad cortex, there's a big update coming for that. Version 3.0 that I really want to get into, but that's that could be coming anytime between now and June which isn't that far away, thankfully. So, yep, yeah, I'm going to wrap things up. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for your input. I always find it useful. And if you're new here, subscribe. I'm about to hit another milestone, which is exciting. So please do subscribe and ring the bell if you haven't already. And if you're watching this later on, please do. I just need about 20 more subs to get to 18K, which is awesome. Am I using the FR12? Yes, that thing is great. I really like it. If you get one, just make sure when you turn it on with nothing connected, you don't get a load of hiss. If you do, send it back and get another one. The one I have does have a little bit of hiss, as any speaker does. So the problem is now I've opened a can of wor worms with this thing. People are reaching out now and saying, Aaron, I got one. There's this little hiss when I put my ear next to it. I'm like, yes, there will be with any speaker. When I had hiss with the original unit, I was sitting across the room. It was as loud as the heating system in the apartment. That was bad. So get, make sure you get one that's a, a recently been shipped from Fender and make sure when you turn it on, it's just normal expected levels of, of background noise, noise floor. And um, I really love it. And it works great with the Quad Cortex. It really does. I just ordered a, a, a padded cover for it so I can actually take it out. It comes with a, a very thin um, cover. But I ordered the Studio Slips cover so I can have it in there and take it out. That's going to be my rig going forward for electric. Quad Cortex into FR12, amazing. And I always have the PA with me anyway, or go into a PA. So guitar into PA, into FR12, done. I've, 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 I've pretty, pretty committed to that now. It's a great rig. The sounds great in here. I've still got my real amp, but I'm not going to take my real amp out anywhere. That's just for the apartment, just to play through a real amp sometimes. All right. So yeah, I really, really love that FR12. Not sure if I'd get the 12 or the 10 if I did it again. I might get the 10 to get something even smaller, but I don't regret the 12 because it is a bit bigger, um, which may sound better, and it hasn't got the hiss, so I don't, I'm not going not gonna to change it now. I'm happy with it. And it's still pretty light. It's, it, the, the FR10 is only two pounds lighter, one pound lighter or something. Um, so it's still very compact compared to a tube amp for sure especially with the Quad Cortex. That's a great rig. All right. I'm going to wrap things up. I'm going to say good night. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your time. I always appreciate it. Uh, take care and be well. Hopefully I have some more news on the acoustic guitars next week. 
And um, like I said, make sure that you subscribe and ring the bell, because if I do post a video during the week, which I may do, then you'll be notified of when it goes live. Take care and be well. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. the holiday is what you said to me I need to get away from you and as I watched her lying next to me I wished for a holiday too